With June and Nils, do we start on the hour or do we usually have a grace period? Yeah, I think it's good to start on time. Uh, it okay. wasn't recorded anyway. Uh, let me see. Yeah, it is on time. Yeah. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Topology Optimization Webinar. Today is almost the end of the summer, so I wish you all have enjoyed a great summer vacation. Uh, the session today is kind of organized by Professor Josephine Castinson from Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Josephine, thank you very much for your efforts in organizing the session today. The floor is yours. Well, thank you, June, for inviting me. And mostly thank you to our five speakers for postponing their holidays. I'm just learning and, and accepting the invitation. Uh, we have five great talks lined up today, I, I think. Um, by Ming Yong Shu from Shanghai Jiao Tong University, from Emily Sanders at Georgia Tech, from Shangping Wan at Northwestern Polytechnical University, uh, George Louis Berrara from University of Colorado at Boulder, or now Lawrence Livermore, and Feng Wen Wang, who will hopefully join us in a minute or two from Technical University of Denmark. Um, I hope I've not started by butchering everybody's names. And if so, I'm terribly sorry. Um, the format today will be as in the other seminars that um, there'll be about 12 minutes of presentation from each of the presenters followed by three minutes Q and A. Um, and um, we'll have at the end, 10 minutes for more in depth discussion and, and more opportunities to ask questions. Um, was I going to say anymore? Yes, the Q and A will will um, can either work that um, you post a question in the chat and, and I can ask for um, the, the presenter, or we can also, since we're not the biggest crowd yet, uh, raise your hand and, and you can ask the question yourself. I think we can administer that. Um, I think. Even though I spoke a bit too fast, um, maybe without further ado, I will introduce Ming Dong. So, if you will share your screen, um, Ming Dong Shu is an uh, associate professor at the Department of Mechanical Engineering at Shanghai Jiao Tong University. His research interest includes multidisciplinary topology optimization for additive manufacturing and generative design. Prior to joining Shanghai Jiao Tong University, he worked at the Top Up Group at the Technical University of Denmark and at Simulier's Tosca team in Germany. Please, Ming Dong, the, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Josephine, for the introduction. And uh, this is Ming Dong from Shanghai. Hello, everyone. And uh, first of all, I'd like to Thanks, uh, organizer, the webinar for this top webinar. It's a great initiative that bring us together at this uh, special uh, period of time. So today, uh, I'm very glad to meet you all and uh, take this opportunity to, to share one of our recent works on topology optimization of self-supporting infills. So when we're talking about infills, it normally comes with shells, right? So for instance, like infills for fixed shells design or concurrent shell infill design. So this type of structures, broadly speaking, so in traditionally it's become recognized as a hard to manufacture structure type, but potentially if it is designed in a proper way, it may expect some nice features. For instance, it could be lightweight, high strength to weight ratio and buckling resistance, et cetera. Uh, that's why thanks to this uh, fast development of additive manufacturing, so now this type of structure can be realized. And uh, so the shell and the power infuse not only becoming a uh, hot risk topic, at least in our communities in the past few years, but also you can see there are some industrial applications actually emerging recently. 
So in this next slides, I summarized only a few of the uh, uh, works that uh, we're working on. So please excuse me that if your work is not here due to the space limit. So the point I want to make it here is that apart from what we have known for well-known engineer projects that you say for a given shell, you can put like uh, predefined patterns into this shell and got this parse design. But for us, like topology observation players, we always can leverage some smart tools to design this, right? So for instance, like we can do these freeform topology optimizations for fixed shell and also for the dynamic shell, also known as the concurrent optimization of shell and the infuse. So here are some nice works, but what we found that some of the most of the works are uh, somehow lack of the overhang control when actually designing this concurrent to shell infill or for fixed shell. But on the other hand, on the right side, you can say there are indeed some other works that considering these manufacturabilities, for instance, like the like drain in back in 2016 and uh, has this works that by putting uh, very smartly some of the unit cells or, or you can call it like self-supporting primitives uh, inside this design domain, you can actually achieve some nicely behaved and also um, manufacturable designs. And also we can see some other uh, works too, which is based on this so-called self-supporting unit cell. But nevertheless, one can easily see that this type of approach is somehow has this design space somehow limited. So how to close the gap between these two and solve these two issues together? That's the motivation of our work today. So here is an outline of the strategy that we tackle this problem. So we look into the infield designs that uh, it should somehow uh, covering these four important aspects when you design uh, infields for additive manufacturing. The first one is that because sometimes uh, most likely the infields will be inside the shell. So it must be first self-supporting and also provide support to the exterior shelves. That's the first thing we need to consider. And the second, because the infuse is also the part of the structure we need to think about the mechanical property. Uh, besides that, so porous feature for lightweight, for reduced weight, and also length scale control is another two geometric aspects that we need to also consider. So next, I will go step by step and see how we take this problem and for each aspect. So first one is this uh, overhang control. So we propose a new overhang constraint, which is based on a, a well, very famous, uh, or also well-known technique, the additive manufacturing filterings. So uh, this is proposed by Professor Lagner back in 2017. So with these techniques, one can easily got this uh, self-support structure, top-up structure to satisfy this, 40, for instance, 45 degree and overhead angles. But somehow in our work, we do it, we apply these things in a different way. Uh, because what we, the purpose is we want to confine or constrain the, the overhands inside the shell. So for shell infill structures, what we do is that we first do a padding, domain padding, and then uh, domain padding results in auxiliary field here, and we then do an AM filter. So by calculating the difference between this field, we can actually uh, find or uh, identify the overhead ranges inside the infill or inside the shell. So the second step, once we have this overhead regions, we just constrain the overhead volume at the total volume to be smaller than a very small threshold. And uh, we expect that by constraining, the, by putting this constraining at the end of the day, we may have a, uh, a infill that is self-supporting and also supports the external uh, shell. So, and next is that we put with this constraint, we put into a, a standard top up model and we minimize the compliance of the whole structure. And with this local volume constraint for porosity consideration, global volume for weight reduction, and the overhang constraint that we introduced just now. And the, underneath that, and the whole thing is we have this density filter and the projection. So, so here is uh, one design results. So this famous bone structures, what we got, he optimized this here very nicely. The topology, you can see uh, the mechanical properties optimized, all the constraints satisfied, and also the infills is self-supporting. So everything so far is all right, but uh, if we take a closer look, we found that something's fishing here, and uh, which is we are very familiar, that is one node connected structure. So it happens uh, at the regions when the load bearing is not significant, but the support is needed. So the, the things that are optimized are just so smart to put the least material to satisfy the overhang constraint. 
here. So in order to do that, so we are, so we are, so it's very fam famous, uh, very, very similar to the one node hinge problem. So the solution is of course to add minimal length scale to it. So what we do is that we leverage a very computationally cheap approach without any extra uh, geometric constraint. We use this so-called multi-field formulation which was proposed by Boyan Lazarov and the phone one. Uh, back in uh, 2016. So the idea is that you can evaluate this design responses measure on the eroded field and also put a volume constraint on the dilated field at the end, you got some uh, minimal length scales in the nominal one, which is in, in implicitly defined with, uh, but you, one can also uh, derive that explicit, but, but uh, we're gonna discuss it later. So here, uh, we just uh, further developed it in, uh, in our approach. We found that two field formulations is enough. We no need to have this dilated one. So we just have nominal and erode it and put uh, the, the, the apply this idea and put this two field formulation in our work. And you can see that for the compliant, for the objective, we have eroded design. For the overhead constraint, we have both field uh, constraint. So with this formulation, what we can end up with is this uh, a design which is have uh, self-supporting infills uh, with uh, minimal length scale. And comparing to the other without the length scale, the one we just saw, and also without overhead counts, you can see the OE actually is the number of overhead, number of overhead elements. So on the right-hand side, without overhead constraints, so there are a lot of this kind of the red regions, which is not very favorable from a manufacturing point of view. And with the approach, one can also uh, play with this uh, radius, uh, density, uh, radius of density filter to control the actual minimal length scale, uh, which shows that the, the approach is, uh, uh, have these uh, design possibilities to, to have for different applications. So, so far we have, uh, uh, considered for the fixed shell, and we can design in the self-supporting infills for fixed shell, but how about the dynamic one? So uh, actually the formulation has a uh, promotion for concurrent shell infill has been started many years ago by June and back in 2017. And we uh, also adopt this uh, formulations and we do a little bit work on top of it. So the, to, this, this proposition is to me just so smart. And uh, of course it's a little bit complex. It has two design variables and the three phases, say in the base uh, region, the infill and also the shell by playing this uh, density filter projection and also bridge norm. And uh, at the end, you will get this shell infill uh, parameterizations. So with this parameterizations, the, the, the way of the design itself supported infills is just as the same as, uh, as same to the previously. So you have this uh, shell infill parameterization and do the domain padding to got this auxiliary field because the one difference to the previous is that now uh, we have this dynamic shell. So the auxiliary field is, uh, uh, is just a, a function of the design variables. And then we apply the same idea that using the EM filtering and calculate difference and constraint it, then everything is just uh, very easy and straightforward. For the two field formulation, this is a big tricky part and uh, which is uh, more complex, seems more complex than the previous one. For the objective, we have uh, width compliance and, uh, and for the, uh, and we also utilize this overhand constraint, which is also considered two fields. Uh, the, the four fields here, C1, C2 and, uh, and the T zeta and the T zeta wrote it, all of them are, are necessary in order to have a workable uh, design or, nice or meaningful design at the end. Uh, but due to time limitation, I will not go into details, but the, the idea is that we have these two, two field formulations to control the minimal length scales on base regions and also the infills, both of them. So with that, so here is uh, the well famous tentative beam examples. So here is uh, the design process and the optimized result. Now we can concurrently design and optimize the shells together with the infills, but at the same time, we can guarantee that the infills are self-supporting and also can provide support to the exterior shells. The final overhead element is uh, zero. And here is a little bit of result comparison that if we get rid of the overhead constraints, then you can see a lot of the overhead regions and also compared to some engineer projects, our projects, the compliance is much more lower than the, the engineer ones. 
So here is a prototype that we, we, we got, actually we printed out. So the white here is a sacrificial support and you can see the left one is uh, our result and the, the right one is a without any constraint. You can see uh, by using our approach is a very high quality prototype is obtained, but without manufacturing uh, constraint overhead control, you can see there's a, a, a collapse here. So to wrap it up, so we, just developed approach, very uh, simple and straightforward ones, uh, which is based on uh, quite a few of existing techniques. So the, the core one, the core technique is overhead control uh, with this AM filter and also lens scale control with two field, two field formulation. And uh, of course, uh, this is, so all the example here now is 2D and 2 and half D. So the future extensions could be, we, we just, we are developing the real 3D applications, for instance, like considering the closed wall. And we can, hopefully we can uh, utilize this project to consider more design responses, considering the multidiscipline, multifunctional design. So here are two reference and uh, that's it. With that, I would like to, Thank all your attention, and uh, I will be glad to take any comments and questions. Thank you all. Thank you, Mingdong. Excellent. Um, do we have uh, any burning questions? Yes, Binui. Yeah, yeah, just uh, one quick, quick question. How do you identify the interface between the shell and the infill? Okay, the question is how to identify the interface between the shell and the infill. So the, the, the thing is that we don't need to identify the, the, the interface. So uh, with this parameterizations, let's say, let's, let me go back to the slides. Here. So actually this is, uh, we, we use, use Jun's uh, parameterization and uh, here, uh, we already have a different field defined and we just do a little bit of, uh, do some set operations that for instance, like a union, then we can guard this shell infill out of the base region and uh, out, uh, to define the shell out of the base region and plus this infills, we can have this shell infills. I didn't write the actual formulations here, but uh, uh, if you go look into the paper or if you refer to the, uh, this, this works, then you will say that uh, uh, the, 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 uh, actually the shell if you can be well defined and the thing is that we don't necessarily need to capture the interface between them and all the self supportness can be done by this, uh, this operations. So there's no need okay. to, uh, for instance, like to say, like we for first force the infill to be self talk No, it's a, it's a simultaneously guarantee that the infills to be uh, self-support and also can provide support to the uh, the shells. Okay, thank you. I will re refer to the paper, Jingbo's paper. Thank you. Yep. Yes. You're welcome. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for a very nice presentation, uh, Mingdang. I, I do have one yeah. question, or maybe as a clar clarification first, and then my question. So you are using the old Anas Clausen interface identification trick with the gradient or are you using the robust formulation where you simply just subtract the dilated from the, or the eroded from the dilated to get the interface? Mm, okay, that's a question. So you order, so first question I would say that you have, you have two questions actually. The first one is uh, uh, to, in order to get the shell, we didn't, we didn't change anything from the dreams work. We just do this gradient. It's okay. uh, very much, very, very similar to what we have done for the minimal length scale uh, back, in, back in old times. That's mm -hmm. the first question. And for the two field things, there, this is a tricky part. Here we have two, two design variable here, and uh, we do the projections on um, both of them for mm -hmm. the eroded and the nominal. And then there's uh, four different design responses, actually a combination of these four fields. Yep. Uh, this is yep. uh, something we need to yeah, play with because uh, once you do something, uh, do a different combination, the whole thing may not work, but we just find out with this combination, for instance, like this uh, C1 and C2, you somehow need to uh, have this, uh, 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 this uh, th let me say, this infuse to be eroded, but the base to be the nominal. Okay, so, and, and so thank you for the clarification. 
Yes. Um, so I, 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 I admit that this is a uh, little. Uh, but my question is then, because having worked a bit with that, that's usually leading to a quite a, a what you call it, a, a numerical unstable scheme. So how do you experience this? How sensitive is it when you change models and try different designs out or change the parameters? Is this something you could put, make a, put into an app and ensure that it will always come out nice and clean? Uh, there are, so to answer your questions, so actually we have done quite a lot of things which I haven't talked here. With, uh, to, be, to be very honest, if you directly solve the model that I'm showing on this screen, then it's uh, nasty. And yeah. you have to, it's very nasty to be born on this. Then you have to, we, we, and so essentially we, we for, for, the cons, for the overhead constraints, actually we had a uh, adjust, uh, so kind of the continuation process to somehow okay. gradually uh, to lower down this uh, constraint value. That's one thing. And for the other thing, because you have so many parameters here, projection parameter, you can say one, two, three, and you need to develop uh, somehow after a trial and error for many many times. Then, then luckily we are able to to to, to be honest, we are we are got a, a sort of a stable uh, parameter tooling strategies uh, for for getting all these uh, designs out. Yeah. yeah, but I was just I was just curious because it's really amazing how many things you can combine and still end up with designs. So uh, very nice work being <laughs> done. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Thank you. I think I will I will cap the discussion here for now. We have a little bit more time at the end, but thank you again, Ming Dong, for, for the very excellent presentation. We will move on to our next speaker, um, Emily Sanders. Um, she recently received her PhD from the School of Civil and Environmental Engineering at Georgia Tech. Um, and come January, she will joined the Department of Mechanical Engineering at Georgia Tech as an assistant professor. Congratulations with that, Emily. Um, Emily will discuss a recent paper on optimal and continuous multi-lattice embedding. The virtual floor is yours. Thank you, Josephine. Uh, so today I'm gonna to present on behalf of myself and my co-authors, Anderson Pereira and Glossio Paulino. And the main focus of our work is to optimally design macro scale geometries, and at the same time, optimally distribute porous anisotropic architected materials within. So this is one of the parts that we designed and manufactured. It's about 14 and a half centimeters tall. And if you look carefully, you'll see that there are clearly some micro scale features here. If you look very carefully, you'll notice that those micro scale features actually vary from point to point within the larger geometry. So here you can see two distinct microarchitectures and a transition between. And so the goal of today's presentation is to understand how we can design parts like these using topology optimization, and then subsequently how we can manufacture these parts that have a high level of complexity at both the macro and micro scales. Uh, but why are we interested in parts that have these two characteristics, spatially varying properties and hierarchical architectures? Well, many natural systems rely on these features to achieve various functionalities. For example, here we have the cuttle bone, which is the internal porous shell structure of the cuttlefish. It has a layered architecture and some pillars that enable it to resist the high pressures experienced in the deep sea. And also the porosity here enables the cuttlefish to be lightweight and also to control its buoyancy. So here, hierarchical architectures are contributing to some functionality in a natural system. In terms of spatially varying properties, there are many examples of biocomposites in natural systems. Here we have the mantis shrimp that has this club that sort of snaps to strike its prey with a large amount of force. And it turns out that biocomposites play a key role in the damage tolerance of this system. If you look here, you can see that the stiffness and the hardness are functionally graded through the cross section of that club. And these authors here found that cracks tend to nucleate at the interface between these two distinct stiffness regions. And because of this abrupt change in stiffness in what they call the impact region, those cracks are prevented from propagating all the way to the exterior and you get some damage tolerance. So with these and other natural systems in mind, our goal is really to design and manufacture engineered parts that mimic some of these features. Again, spatially varying properties and hierarchical architectures. 
And to do that, we're going to take a, a multi-lattice topology optimization design approach, and we'll do a multi-lattice embedding, ensuring connectivity between the different microarchitectures, and then finally, multi-lattice manufacturing, where we use a voxel-based approach to communicate with a 3D printer. So we'll start here with design. And our approach is to adopt a general multi-material topology optimization formulation proposed by some of my colleagues a few years back, uh, volume constraint compliance minimization, and the formulation can handle an arbitrary number of candidate materials, and it has a very flexible setting of volume constraints such that each constraint can control any subset of the candidate materials in any sub-region of the domain. And in this formulation, we have a density design variable field for each of our M candidate materials. We apply a density filter to establish minimum length scale and uh, regularize the problem. But to ensure that in the final solution, we have a single material at each point in our domain, uh, we adopt some material interpolation functions. So this first one here is, is your standard SIMP, which is going to penalize intermediate densities. And then the second interpolation here penalizes material mixing. It was inspired by the work of Stegman and Lund on fiber orientation optimization. But we introduced this parameter gamma here that enables us to smoothly transition from the convex case where both intermediate densities and material mixing are okay to the case where both of those things are penalized. So what you're looking at here in these plots is the interpolated stiffness in a given element that has two candidate materials. Um, and you'll see at this back corner here, where both materials are fully dense, you have full material mixing, you see that the stiffness goes to zero. And so it makes it inefficient to have mixing in your design. And we found that this continuation scheme uh, is pretty effective at mitigating the influence of the initial guess on the final design. Now here in this interpolation, we focus on the scalar isotropic material parameter Young's modulus. But our formulation can handle a more general setting of materials, for example, porous anisotropic architected materials. And today we're going to focus uh, specifically on lattice based periodic uh, materials that are characterized by a periodic tessellation of a given unit cell. To incorporate materials like these, we need to think about two additional details. First, these things are porous. And so when we compute the volume of our structure, we need to account for the porosity. Second, uh, these materials are no longer characterized by two scalar parameters. So rather than interpolating the Young's modulus, we've chosen to interpolate the entire element stiffness matrix, where this element stiffness matrix of material I in element L is dependent on a pre-computed homogenized elasticity matrix of material I. Now, in the paper referenced here, uh, there's much more detail on how exactly these uh, porous anisotropic architected materials influence both the geometry and the material distribution in design. Uh, today, I want to focus more on the manufacturing side and really emphasize the critical importance of integrating the physical relevance of the, of the formulation with, with the manufacturing. Uh, but I will uh, briefly just mention here that we've designed these three cantilever beams considering three different sets of two porous anisotropic architected materials. And the difference between these designs is dictated by the anisotropic mechanical behavior of the microarchitectures that compose them. Now in design, we don't have any knowledge of the specific geometries of the microarchitectures. We simply have a numerical representation of the mechanical properties. So if we want to manufacture these things, we need to embed the microarchitectures into the macro scale geometry. So let's talk a little bit about multi-lattice embedding. There are a few challenges here. One challenge is when we embed these microarchitectures, we need to ensure that they're going to be well connected uh, when you transition from one to the next, right? And so here we have three cases of different types of connectivity that we can handle. So in the first case, we have two unit cells that have the same geometry, but different bar diameter. Um, and so they're guaranteed to be well connected, but you may have an abrupt transition in thickness. In the second case, we have two unit cells with totally different geometry, and no matter where you try to make the connection, they're not going to be well connected. And then in the third case, depending on where we, we try to make the connection, they may or may not be well connected. We want to be able to handle all of these types of cases and achieve nice smooth transitions like you see here, where in the first case, we've done an interpolation on the thickness. Second case, we've done an interpolation on the, on the geometry of the unit cell. And in the third case, we've generated a number of hybrid unit cells to ensure a well-connected transition. Um, so we have some way of handling connectivity. 
Another key challenge here is communicating the complex geometry to the 3D printer. If we were to generate a surface representation or an STL file of the microstructure embedded part, the number of triangles would be enormous. And many times, uh, in many cases, the uh, slicing software wouldn't be able to, to handle it. And so we completely avoid the need to generate a microstructure embedded, uh, a surface representation of the microstructure embedded part. And we're gonna do our embedding directly at the slice level of our 3D printer. Um, so we can think of our part in slices where each slice, think of it as a pixelated image, okay? And we're gonna use a voxel-based approach to do the embedding. So here you're looking at four different ways that we can represent our multi-material topology optimization data, where these macro slices are slices through each of those representations at this location in the beam. And you can see that if we represent the data directly on the underlying mesh that we use in optimization, we get a very jagged, rough boundary, right? If we generate an isosurface for each of our materials individually, we get a smooth boundary, but because of the density filter, we may have some disconnected regions at the interface. But if we project our data onto a body-fitted TET mesh, you can see now we get a smooth boundary, we get a well-connected interface, we know exactly how the material varies through the volume of the part, and if we want to avoid this abrupt interface, we can apply an additional convolution filter and generate a nice, smooth, functionally graded transition. And now we have these macro slices at each layer of our beam, and we can use them as a mapping to embed our microstructures. So at the bottom here, we have our, our blue and our yellow microstructures, and then we have a number of transitional unit cells that enable us to achieve that smooth transition that we discussed previously. We can slice each of these unit cells and tile their slices over the build area. So now in addition to macro slices at each layer of our beam, we also have micro slices at each layer of our beam. And we can go to our macro slices, pick up a pixel. The color of that pixel tells us which microstructure to map into. And we simply replace each pixel in the macro slice with the corresponding pixel of the micro slice. And we end up with these microstructure embedded slices where now you can see the critical importance of the functional grading to achieve connectivity, whereas here the interface is disconnected. So using this approach, we have manufactured our three cantilever beams. Uh, they're each 14 and a half centimeters tall. Here you can see the two unit cells and the transition between. Here's the second one, a nice well-connected transition between two totally different unit cells. Here, the third beam, two unit cells, and the transition between. We also used our formulation to design and manufacture some slightly more complex parts. Here we have a, uh, a canopy structure. The blue region is fixed, the red region is fixed, and we used the optimization to design uh, the supports in between for a vertic vertical uniformly distributed load on the top of the canopy. So at the top is the computational result, at the bottom, the, the manufactured part. Uh, and you can take a look at some of the transition regions close up here. So between the truncated octahedron and the octet, here's the transition somewhere in here. Here's between the octet and the face X. And if you look carefully, we're looking straight on at this edge. And so you can see the diamond around that edge that corresponds to this diamond here. And then in this case, we have the edge the diamond with a bar in the middle that corresponds to this diamond here with a bar in the middle. And then between the truncated octahedron and the face X transition is here, and then the solid and the truncated octahedron. We also designed a, uh, an Eiffel Tower inspired structure. This thing was printed at 26 and a half centimeters tall. And so that's twice the height that our 3D printer can handle. And so it was actually printed in pieces and then assembled later. And this actually highlights the scalability of our approach. So what we did here is we, we uh, sliced the part for a printer twice as big as our 3D printer, and then we divided those slices into pieces. Um, and because we're working at the slice level, we can theoretically arbitrarily scale the macro scale geometry and keep the microstructures at the resolution of the 3D printer and achieve a really large separation of length scales. And I will conclude there and be happy to answer questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emily, for that very exciting presentation. Um, I will open the floor for questions. You can also post questions in the chat. Well, I'll start with the question then. Um, do you have to um, predetermine how many um, 
of the, the material architectures you want to design with. Are, are you talking about in the manufacturing for transitioning or in the optimization? Well, both really. Okay, yeah, so I guess the answer is yes in both cases. So in the optimization, we treat this as a multi-material problem. And so ahead of time, you specify the micro architectures that you want to consider. In this case, we're looking at lattices, but this can be any type of, of different materials that, that you want to consider. Um, in the manufacturing part, um, I think what we've done here is uh, specific to the lattice based architectures that we're currently working with, where you have you know, your different candidates, it can be two, it can be three, however many you need, and then you generate uh, a transition between them in many, so let me go back to the slides. Uh, so for example, here, let's look at this first case because I think it's the simplest to understand. You're just changing the thickness, right? So there's a continuous uh, function, right? Between these two thicknesses. And we basically uh, selected uh, a discrete set of those uh, transitions. And you can make that as, as fine or as coarse as you want and, and you'll get a smoother or less smooth transition. But yeah, we, we decide on those, not before the optimization, but once we're doing the embedding, we need to know, you know what's gonna be in that transition region. I'm thinking that your whatever you choose will affect the mechanical behavior. Yes, absolutely. Uh, I have, let me show you what that looks like. So here we were focused on connectivity only. And so we chose the transitional unit cells to ensure the connectivity. But afterwards we plotted, you know, what, what do the properties look like over that transition region? So here's the stiffness for transitioning between you know, these two different thicknesses. I think this is you know, pretty straightforward to understand. Uh, some of the other ones have slightly different properties. And so we didn't optimize anything. We didn't know how the transition regions would behave. We did this after the fact. But I think that you could uh, do an optimization to kind of control the, the properties of the transition and also guarantee the connectivity. Um, but I will mention also that we did look at how the transition region affects uh, the, well, this is a little bit different, uh, but, you know, based on the length scale of your transition region, we found that it doesn't have a huge impact on uh, the, the global behavior, the compliance, essentially. So here we have the result for, for a discrete interface, and F0 represents the compliance mm -hmm. of that structure. And then we gradually increase the radius and you can see the length scale is increasing and basically the, the, uh, the behavior doesn't change much until you go to extremes, right? So I don't know how much influence, at least for compliance, how much influence mm -hmm. the mechanical behavior of that transition has. Uh, for other things like stress, it may, may, may have a, a big influence, of course. Thank you. I think I ended up taking all the time for question. Is there a quick one before we move on? Well, um, you can save them for the Q&A at the end. Thank you so much, Emily. Um, our next speaker is Shangqing Huang from Northwestern Polytechnical University. Shangqing Huang is an associate professor uh, she has a bachelor and PhD from Nanjiang Technical University, and she specializes in manufacturing using 3D printing. She will discuss her recent paper on multidisciplinary topology optimization, incorporating process structure, property reform, and relationship of additive manufacturing. Shanqing, please. Hello. Hello, everyone. Welcome from the different regions. <laughs> Here we are, night. It's almost midnight now. Uh, good, uh, um, good afternoon from the China to Europeans. Okay, uh, I'm new in the topology of the optimization field. Actually, I was studying uh, additive manufacturing process for many years and developing material as well as the um, process development for many years. Actually, I just know a little bit about topology and optimization. So today I just would like to share some of my opinion about my experience about the structure, property and the performance relationship, how to implement those relationship to make value added for the topology optimization in this, uh, in this talk. 
and uh, uh, I will short introduce for myself. I was studying uh, Singapore for many years, almost 10 years. I got my bachelor and a PhD degree in North uh, South uh, in Nanyang Technological University. And uh, I was studying polymer composite additive manufacturing, especially currently I'm working in China, also developing a new material and a new process for composite material. And uh, after I get into the design field, I feel that uh, how can we put the material at the right place in the space and how to uh, planning the material position in the different space will be very, uh, very much important for the additive manufacturing. That's why I am get into the three-dimensional design as well as the topology field in recent uh, one or two years. Actually, I'm new here and uh, just to share some of my opinion here. And uh, may I introduce the PhD candidate, uh, Dr. Li Xiaoying. He is just uh, uh, almost got his uh, PhD degree in my school and I collaborate with him to de deliver this work, uh, which I will go in to introduce as following. Uh, topology optimization, I think most of the people here, the audience are very, very <laughs> specialist in topology optimization. So I will not uh, introduce too much about that. And in this work, we will focus on the laser-based additive manufacturing. After we get into the manufacturing of additive, we found that especially for laser-based process, no matter you introduce a liquid such as a photopolymer resin as a source material, or you introduce a powder material as a source material using UV, a UV laser or the uh, infrared laser to cure or centering those powder or those liquid, we will find that it's a layer by layer process. Upon the layer building process, it has a very special, unique material performance and the material property after the complete the three dimensional design. We have sharing different type of the application of the AM. However, we found that AM have enabled the very fantastic three-dimensional building capability and how can we fully explore the material potential in three-dimensional um, space, then topology optimization gives us a lot of the advan uh, advices. Uh, but when we go into the topology, especially the traditional optimization, uh, optimization topology optimization, we, we found that uh, people, few of the researchers or few of the people will consider the material process parameter influence. Based on my personal experience, we are working on the material or the process development, we will find that the process parameter, especially the different type of laser parameter as a scanning strategy, as well as some buildings, uh, building direction and the layer thickness or layer uh, slicing uh, um, programming will influence the ending performance of a beauty material or even going to the structural performance. How can we uh, integrate those effects of those parameters influence to our design? That's the motivation for the work, especially in laser processes, laser, different laser parameter, laser scanning speed, laser uh, power, and uh, different hatching space. Those are very significant influence on the energy density input of the process. In the past, a lot of researchers have put the intensive work, work on the multi-physicist modeling and the multi-scale modeling to simulate the process. However, they will find that it's really hard to achieve the cross skew modeling to micro, uh, me, uh, micro to macro to macro size to, to establish the uh, performance relationship to guide the design. So in this work, I'm thinking uh, maybe we can use some very simple but very helpful approach such as some statistic approach uh, or the design of an experiment approach to establish the process parameter uh, influence on the end of the performance of material so that 
we can implement this relationship to our topology design and then can come out something new. And from the design to manufacturing process in the conventionally, we will um, consider the different work as Prof. Joe just tell us a lot of the background. I will not uh, talk too much about the supporting of the production. And uh, then this work, I think, compared with the conventional topology optimization, the come out in this work is that we are forecast focus on the process parameters or group of the process parameters. How does this influence the end of the performance of structure? That will be very uh, helpful for my end product. Right here is the design method and the design logic of my, process, uh, my work. Those process and structure optimization, we are including the material model Currently, we introduce the transverse astrotropics material model to, to describe the uh, layer by layer process uh, post material. As we say that within the layer, the material can be center or bonding very strong, but at the inter layer space, the material will be uh, quite weak or, or slightly weak than the inner space. So it's similar as a composite material layer by layer performance. So we introduce a material now as a talking model to, to describe the AM material. And the property evaluation, we use a um, uh, very normal and a very traditional design of experimental process to determine the process uh, evaluation and to study how does the different process parameter influence the pro end of the pro product performance, such as the uh, uh, stiffness or the strength. That will be you know, very directly to predict, uh, to build the numerical formulation to describe the different set of parameters influence on the end of the properties. Uh, another way, we also study something new called knowledge base for SMP. And the knowledge base is usually a very boring concept, but this work we are using some uh, BP neutral network to establish SMP uh, relationship. Coming slides, I will give a, lot, a little bit exploration. And the following step, very traditional here step, we use the gradient based algorithm and the heuristics algorithm for the um, optimization. And the we uh, not only including the process optimization to, uh, to optimize the different type of the or combinations of process parameters to respect uh, the fixed design of the structure. And also, we can also optimize the process parameter as well as the structural configuration uh, con uh, simultaneously and uh, to achieve the concurrent design. Uh, right here to explain a uh, short explain how does the layer uh, laser induced process influence the pro uh, influence the uh, centering of the bonding process. We can find that the interspace have very interspace between layers and the inner space in layers have different uh, com uh, different material. Uh, forming process. That's why it determines that material have a non-isotropic performance, especially transverse isotropic. And the laser power and laser scan, uh, scanning space and the hatching space and the cross angle, those are very typical uh, process um, parameters determine the end of the product performance. We will consider, uh, majorly we consider the first three parameters in the works because this influence the total energy input for material forming. For the laser centering, we, uh, as we just tell the, uh, the groups, we are using the transverse isotropic uh, formula uh, matrix to describe the materials. And uh, that can help us to suggest the very helpful building direction of the Design structures. This work has been published in the additive manufacturing in last year. After this work, we found that 
how can we integrate those building direction as well as the laser parameters together? Then we come to the property evaluation step. In the property evaluation step, we implement the design of experiment approach. We set a different level to experiment. We include these four of the parameters and the different level of the uh, parameters have been setting right here. And then we have conducted, conducted the real experiment to got the database for different direction as well as the different uh, laser parameter combinations performance. And then we found that a NOVA approach can help us to figure out very so uh, figure out very sophisticated and very um, precise description to present how does the laser power as well laser scanning speed and the directions as well as uh, the individual influence on the final product stiffness as well as the combination influence on the uh, on the end of the product so stiffness. Stiffness, just an uh, example, also can conduct to the strength as well as uh, based on the statistic approach of the very traditional material uh, measurement. It's quite different from the, those guys you are working on the optimization. You have very sophisticated math and to, to derive everything very clearly. But in the uh, process of the experiment, we just uh, conduct a statistic approach to come out the linear or the proportional uh, and to predict the evaluation of the stiffness or the strength. But it's, it truly works and we got the precise description of the relationship. After that, we got the very, the different of the parameters. We can identify the significance influence on the end of the product. And then we can implement this numerically, uh, numerically implement this formula or implement this function or implement this relationship to help us to do the optimization. Right here is a one approach where based on the ANOVA is a statistical, statistical approach. And then it's also, uh, we have got a new idea here. We can use a new neutral network. We have tried the back back propagation net and neutral network is also help us to deliver the similar result as predicted by the statistic approach. We can find that we, uh, we can implement our, improve our uh, laser variables and uh, also deliver our experimental results. And we can find out the relationship through the neutral network. It also can be, uh, in, incorporate with our analytical solution using the network, neutral network. Maybe this work I didn't include in the uh, paper, but I just want to share with the audience. Uh, statistic approach is fine and neutral network is also fine. And uh, those things can also can in, incorporate with the uh, very, very traditional optimization process. Right here, we include the variables, including the building orientation. We use alpha and beta and the, uh, and the laser speed and the laser power and the laser and the hatching space are very significant in, uh, process parameters in our laser process. And the objective is uh, very simple and the op uh, constraints, we just uh, consider the building angles and the design different limitation of the variables and uh, to achieve the optimization. And right here, we also find that we, we can in, induce uh, different limitation uh, limits for volume density as a rotational angle and the variables and uh, to achieve the multidisciplinary optimization. Uh, just to share several samples with uh, different researchers, we can find that if we fix this design and uh, we can change the building orientation as well as uh, combinations of the process parameter, we can find a very uh, converged result as, as shown here. We input the original building process and the uh, uh, after the going through the programming is converged to the building direction to the final direction as well as come out the suggest, 
subjected combination of the process parameters, this tells we can truly implement the numerical analysis with and the statistic uh, status formulation with the optimization process. And uh, it also works the strain energy reduce up to 10 percentage. Another work we find that is similarly is a complex structure right here. We uh, will uh, apply, apply the different loading com combination and then we uh, choose a similar approach. We fix the, uh, we build the building direction as well different combinations of laser process parameters to be variables. It can also converge to a suggested uh, building direction as well as the combination variable. It's the uh, strain energy also can reduce up to nine percentage. It's also a very interesting uh, result for the optimization. And also for the multidisciplinary, we, we define as multi uh, multidisciplinary optimization, but actually it's just includes the different process parameter building, di building directions, as well as a final structure morphology or final structure configuration, it can achieve the concurrent optimization. We found that the, this improves uh, loading conditions. And then we found that at uh, several steps, we can get one result right here. It have a, a very specific combination of the suggested process parameter. And then after several uh, detours, and uh, we can get uh, much good combination for the building direction as a well, process parameter. It's very, it's also uh, looks very interesting for me. We can predict and very precise predict my building direction as well as process parameters. And also we can finally predict the end of the performance, stiffness and the lightweight performance. Right here, just about a very simple summary in the meso, in the micro scale, in the macro scale, the maximum layer laser power and the minimal hatching space uh, is related to our improved energy of the melting pool. It's a much much more on the laser process, but we enhance the bonding strength and reduce the porosity and as well as back, as well as the porosity and the defects. It's just from the aspects of the process researchers can got those uh, conclusion. Okay, just uh, got a short summary for currently work. This uh, this work is not very have very I for myself. Uh, I'm specialized in the materials. I think it's not very uh, have very deep and standing in science in material science, but it's truly come out something. Uh, good for optimization, but from the optimization side, I think it's not very complicated math or also not very complicated derivation of the formulation. So it's just uh, the bridge the gap from the process development with the design optimization. So I just uh, doing something in the uh, cross display works and uh, Hopefully we can get into much deeper in the future and come out more works and more sophisticated and comprehensive work in this aspect and share with the audience, share with our researchers here. Thanks for your listening. Okay, thanks. Thank you so much, Anking. I think actually uh, your expertise is, is uh, very interesting for this uh, community. So, and I, I really enjoyed your talk. In the interest of time, however, because it's sliding for me, I will uh, uh, encourage that any questions are posted to the chat and then we're gonna save them for a little bit later so that everything doesn't slide. Um, I have one myself, for example, that I will save. Uh, and then I think we um, should, should uh, continue to our next speaker. Uh, George Lee Barrera um, from Colorado Boulder, Lawrence Livermore. Um, we're going to change a little bit the methodology as well. Uh, George Lee will talk about whole seeding in level set topology optimization via density fields. Please go ahead. Okay.
Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Jorge Luis. Uh, thank you for the invite and uh, the introduction. So before I start, you as a disclaimer, you see the Lawrence Seymour National Laboratory in the background, but this work was actually performed when I was a PhD student at TU Boulder, together with Marcus Geis, a former uh, lab mate, under the supervision of Kurt Malte. So those of you, of you that have worked on level set uh, methods, you're aware that your convergence designs are usually very initial seed independent, right? And there are some cases like the one that I'm showing here in which small changes in your initial seeding can actually generate, uh, they generate your design to something suboptimal like what you see here, right? Um, and this happens maybe because your constraints are violated, uh, you have uh, mass stress some energy uh, point of interest that you're not actually capturing well at the beginning of the optimization problem. And you can say, okay, well, instead of just having a small number of holes, what you could do is uh, have a seeding that includes more holes. And in some cases, this is enough. But even when that uh, when you have to do this, you can see that um, there are a few issues here. So one of them is that you first need a finer mesh to be able to capture this uh, the number of holes that you want to include. Uh, two, the analysis may become more expensive. And three, more importantly, is that as you can see in the column of the right, on the right, um, you can have probably more intricate topologies, but that does not necessarily translate into uh, better performance in your designs. Um, only you'll make it more difficult to manufacture, right? So we want to avoid uh, doing something like this excessive initial seed. So we proposed in this work was to use a density field to inform the level set problem and nucleate holes only where needed. So the starting point is the typical uh, level set formulation in which everything above your level set field uh, is material, everything below the level set field is void, and the interface is defined by the zero isocontour. So uh, what we do here is that on top of this, we include a density problem within the material phase. So um, we, in this case, we use the same method, but we, what we want to do is to interpolate material properties everywhere where we define material in the level set problem. And to better show this, what I want to do, I have this simple structural compliance with mass minimization, uh, compliance minimization with mass constraint example, uh, with the symmetry condition along the left side and uh, distributed load along the top. So what I want to happen is something that looks a little bit like this. So the level set field evolved throughout the optimization problem and everywhere you see low density, so light gray, you have holes being nucleated, such that you go from a pure density problem, so fixed background mesh with a fictitious density field to a pure level set problem meaning uh, very clearly the defined interfaces with just material and non-material. So we're not the first ones in doing this. Uh, actually in our group, we have done something like this before, similar. We have combined both level set and density uh, approaches to uh, get optimal designs, but not for whole seating purposes. Um, others have tried to use some type of relaxed topological derivative or level set bank methods to control the influence of the density field in your uh, level set problem. What we want to do here is something slightly different. Well, actually, we have two approaches here. What we call the single and the two field approaches, and both have the same basic components. And this is a set of optimization variables that we call S, uh, either phi or rho, and they are filtered using the, the typical, the, the standard linear filter, um, distance-based filtered. And then we generate a field from this filtered uh, optimization variables. Now, the first approach that, that we uh, consider was the single field coupling. And the idea here is that you have a single set of optimization variables that control both the level set and the density problems. And we couple them by using the simple algebraic expressions that you see here and that very exemplify here in this uh, image. So what you see here is that uh, from the level set standpoint, everything above zero, it's material. So omega one, everything below zero, it's void, omega two. And from a density standpoint, well, you're only defined linearly in the material phase. And you can clearly see here how the density and the level set field are coupled. So everywhere you have low densities, the level set field will go, will go uh, down close to zero and then you generate holes. Now, the problem with this approach, we thought could be, is that, well, you have these two fields, but not, not, they're not completely independent, right? They're dr driven by the same set of optimization variables. So what would happen if we use uh, two set of independent uh, optimization variables, right? One from the level set for, that controls the level set field and another one that controls the density field. And the idea here was, hey, we will provide them complete freedom, then probably we'll get to better minimum, right? To get better performance in our design. So that was the spirit of this second approach, this two field approach. Um, but of course, since here you have 
completely independent uh, density and level set fields, then the way we couple them is a little bit more intricate. And the way we did this is by introducing a penalty term. And what this expression here says is pretty much what you see here. What, what this means is that um, anywhere, again, this is material omega one or material omega two, and anywhere that where you have a, a small density, so every, anywhere below this row threshold, we penalize uh, positive values of the level set field. So if the density is low, we will make the level set field go down below zero such that a hole is nucleated in your problem, right? And where do we introduce this penalty for the two-field coupling? Well, we add it as a, uh, another term in our opti uh, objective. So this is a typical, our typical optimization problem formulation uh, that we use. So F here in the objective is your quantity of interest, what you're interested in, your strength, energy, mass, et cetera. Then typically we include two, these two terms, the perimeter and the realization terms. The primary penalty is more to get in your level set problem some smooth or uh, converged designs to avoid this weekly uh, behavior of your optimal uh, geometries. And the realization is to uh, promote the smooth evolution of your optimization problem and have a stable um, overall process. Now we introduce this fourth term here for the two field coupling. Um, and of course, a set of uh, constraints that are problem dependent. Well, I also mentioned that we wanted to go from a pure level uh, density problem to a pure level set problem. And we do this by introducing this density shift. So the idea here is that there's this parameter, rho sh, that um, through a continuation uh, scheme goes from a very small value uh, to one. So such that at the end of the optimization problem, you have this uh, completely independence of the density field, rho of x because this density, the one that you use to interpolate your material properties is going to be equal to one. And the effect of this can be seen here in this, uh, in this example. So for the single field coupling, by construction, uh, if you remember the previous expression that they're linearly dependent. So in the vicinity of the interface, you have intermediate densities without the, the shift. And if you include the shift that goes through to one at the end of optimization problem, this is removed. Similar, uh, something similar happened to the two field coupling, but here, since they are completely independent, your intermediate densities can be anywhere. And in this case, they're just somewhere in there in the material side. Uh, and they're also removed by the two field coupling. Now, this is not the end of the story for the two field coupling because it, remember I mentioned that what we did is we introduced this penalty term into the objective, right? So this objective has already a few terms, right? <laughs> so there might be some interplay between these terms. In order to me to show the, a little bit more how this interplay uh, works, I have this simple problem in which I want to generate a hole. So, and let's look at the 1D example, right? So first uh, I have no holes and I want this hole to be generated. So at the beginning of the process, um, you have a density of one level set field at the upper bound and the penalty of the two field coupling is inactive zero. So because of the problem, the density uh, wants to go down, the problem wants to remove material here. So the density starts going down, but nothing happens in the level set field because the penalty is inactive. And as long as the this density is under above the threshold, but at some point it will go beyond the threshold. And in this region where it's beyond the threshold, the penalty is active. And because of the influence of the penalty, the level set field starts going down, deeping, um, as you see here. This process continues uh, until after you cross the zero isocontour, but once this happens, you, the hole is generated. And throughout the process, what is happening is that this hole is getting bigger in size, right? And at the end of the problem of the whole seating uh, process, you have a regularized level set field that the penalty is off and uh, because of the influence of a density field. This is the entire process for when you generate a hole. Now, unfortunately, there might be some adverse effects between of the components of the realization and premium penalty and the new penalty, uh, the couple penalty, because, uh, well, as I mentioned earlier, the realization is trying to make you have a well-realized level set field. With that, what I mean is having something that looks like this, clearly defined upper and lower bounds and a nice gradient of one. This is what you typically want in, in a level set field to have a smooth uh, problem. But so your level set realization, once it sees this dip start uh, evolving, it may want to make it move up to what you had before. Similarly, uh, for the premier penalty, you can see that when you generate a hole, sometimes the holes are going to be very small and uh, the penalty will say, hey, you just generate a hole that is not actually contributing much to your problem. You can just remove it to reduce the premium penalty. And then your hole sitting is going to be uh, uh, 
and completely annihilated because of this uh, penalty. So the take home message here is that in order for this two field coupling to work appropriately, um, the perimeter penalty, the contributions should be larger than the regularization and the perimeter penalties. That's the take home message here. Now, uh, the real motivation for uh, developing this tool was uh, this approach was really uh, a more realistic setup, right? Because we were having issues with whole seeding. That's what we wanted to uh, use with this linear approach. Um, and in order to me to show you, showcase how this works, I have this uh, DARPA project a problem. And uh, long story short, uh, this problem, what it wants to do is to transport this box that you have there to from point A to point B. And we had to design the structure such that it minimizes mass and it doesn't exceed a stress constraint, right? And we want to generate the structures that connect the supports to the bolts as you see here in this picture. So what we did is that we generated the locally refined mesh and uh, the problem formulation is as follows. We won't have time to go into the details. I just want you to appreciate like that the approaches that I've shown here were tested in a more realistic setup and a more realistic optimization problem formulation. And uh, as you will see in the next slide, uh, they both work. Uh, again, we do not have uh, an initial hole seeding. Um, we have a completely just a density field at the beginning of our optimization problem. And you can see this are the converge the optimal results for both uh, approaches, the single and the two field coupling. From uh, um, visually, you can see that there are some clear differences in the topology. However, in terms of performance, if you look at the numbers, they're pretty similar. So the findings here are like, despite we were hoping that the two field coupling, because of you have more freedom in, in how you evolve your design, we might get better optimal solutions, at least for this type of structural problems, we couldn't see that happening. So what we'll learn from here. So I presented two strategies to uh, generate holes in a level set approach. Um, we, uh, there are some uh, considerations that need to be taken into account to avoid preventing whole nucleations and because of the interplay of the penalty terms in the formulation. Um, superiority of one over the other in terms of the seeding strategies could not be established. And uh, we need to explore other physics and optimization problem formulations to actually try to really assess where this two field coupling has some uh, benefits and some problems. And that's it for my talk. Thank you very much. I will happy to Thank answer you. any questions. Thank you so much, uh, George Louis. Um, I think in the interest of time, I will uh, encourage Nils to wait with his question. Um, <laughs> and um, let Feng Wing, uh, who has come, joined us rapidly from ICTAM, um, take over the floor and give us her presentation. Feng Wing Wang is a yeah. researcher, senior researcher at the Department of Mechanical Engineering at the Technical University of Denmark. And she will tell us a bit about 3D architected isotropic materials with tunable stiffness and buckle resistance. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, first, I would thank the organizer to invite me to discuss our recent work on 3D architecture to isotropic material with tunable stiffness and uh, buckling strength. Um, first, I will introduce. I will start with motivations and uh, talk a little bit uh, about material evaluation, material buckling strength evaluation evaluations. Afterwards, I will present our optimization. Uh, formulations to to design materials with a tunable stiffness and buckling strength. Then I will uh, present some optimization results. I uh, use topology optimization and uh, also same also shape optimized uh, materials. Then I will end my talk with uh, conclusions. So it has been tradition in the community to seek stiffness optimal. Uh, materials back, back to nine, even back to the 1985. And in our group, uh, we'll use topology optimization to find the stiffness also optimal orthotropic plate structures and the corresponding open cell counterpart. And uh, back in 2017, he presents the stiffness optimal isotropic plate structures and uh, good and more also uh, find the corresponding uh, open cell counterpart. However, stiffness only tells the uh, 
deformation resistant of the material is the only one part of the story. Another part of story is the unlimited load capacity of the material, which is determined by material strength. It could be yielding strength or buckling strength. In this study, we only consider buckling strength. For those who are not uh, familiar with uh, material buckling, uh, buckling strain analysis, I first uh, briefly introduce you how we can evaluate material buckling uh, strains using material buckling analysis. We, if we have a uh, periodic uh, materials, we take these uh, uh, microstructures, then we employ a homogenization method to get effective material properties. Use the effective material properties, we can convert. Uh, Marcus uh, scale stress situation to a local stress situations. For example, here hydrostatic uh, compressions or unilateral compressions. Then we perform linear material buckling, linear buckling analysis to get the buckling uh, factors in order to capture both short short wavelengths and long wavelengths buckling mode. We employ block flow keep boundary conditions. Numerical simulation shows we don't have to search uh, through the whole k space. We only need to search all the k vector along the irreducible Blair zone edge indicated by the red lines. Then we can get the band structures. Then the material buckling strength is determined by the lowest uh, critical critical um, buckling factor here. One thing I have to mention depends on your load conditions or your, uh, your microstructure geomet geometric symmetries. The irreducible Boolean zone can be different. To summarize, first we convert the macro scale stress to a local stress, use homogenized material properties. Then we perform linear buckling analysis uh, in order to capture all the possible buckling modes. Then the Critic, the material buckling strains, it determines by the lowest possible critical, uh, lowest possible buckling factors, sorry. Um, use this uh, material uh, strains evaluations. We studied four different macro structures. Um, this plot, the corresponding band structure, the first band structures, we can see compared to the stiffness optimal closed wall macro structures, open wall cells outperform in terms of uh, buckling strains. If uh, my colleague um, studied uh, this, this four type of microstructures for different volume fractions, we, we obtained uh, two terms interpolation schemes, both for Yash modulus and buckling strain and yielding strains. These uh, two terms interpolation scheme can accurate predict Yash modulus buckling strain and yieldings up to a volume fraction of 50%. Um, for, this is uh, for unilateral compressions. Interesting things I would like to point out is for buckling strains, as one can see, plate structures has a higher order volume fraction dependency compared to a truss uh, lattice. With this indicate at a low volume fraction, truss lattice uh, shows higher buckling uh, strains. However, if we go up to module or even higher volume fractions, plate structures will show uh, higher buckling strains because the high, high coefficient. So now the question is whether we can find some microstructure configurations which can show a tunable stiffness and buckling strains performance. So. In order to do that, we formulate an uh, optimization problem. The objective of the optimization is to minimize uh, the weight sum of inverse of the buckling strings and also inverse of the Yash modulus. Here we use the PS aggregations to approximate the maximum of the inverse of the buckling strings. At the same time, we introduce uh, isotropic conditions put a constraint in the tenor number. As usual in the community, we use a joint sensitivity analysis to get the sensitivity of the objective and the constraints. In order to more accurate calculate element stiffness, we use a Q11 element. 
In this study, we mainly focus on to obtain isotropic single lens skew microstructures. Therefore, we introduce a lens skews use a robust formulations. So as a first case, we try to optimize a microstructures with a uh, maximize with maximum packing strength and hydrostatic loadings. And this is uh, the initial designs. This is the optimized blueprint. And this is a slide view. We can see the optimized microstructures does possess a well-defined lens skills. This image shows the band diagrams of the optimized structures. And this shows the cor corresponding critical buckling mode. We can see compared with the initial gas, the material, the material buckling stream has been significantly enhanced. Now we know our optimization formulation works. We will focus on to design um, a material class with the tunable properties and uh, unilateral compressions. As a first case, we set gamma equal to zero, which means we try to maximize the Yash modulus of the materials. This is a result we get. This is, again, this is a critical buckling mode. For people who are familiar with the material designs, we, they may notice, actually, this is a suboptimal structures for Young's modulus. The reason why we get this structure is due to the length scale we imposed is much larger than the stiffness optimal uh, microstructures, as shown in the reference one. In the second case, we try to optimize microstructures to, to maximize the buckling strength by set gamma one equal to, equal to one. This is the result we get. This is the corresponding material properties. We can see um, this material does has a much better uh, buckling strength at a small cost of the Yash modulus. This image shows the geometric comparisons between the two designs where the gray regions shows the region owned by the microstructure optimized for your modulus. The, the pupil regions shows the region owned by microstructure optimized for buckling strings. And the orange color shows the regions owned by both of them. We can see actually the material buckling strings is significantly enhanced by membrane sink sinking here. Okay, now we get uh, a microstructure configuration has a better buckling strength. As we all know, topology optimization has um, uh, can lead to one irregular shapes. So now, can we do a shape a parameter, parameterization and perform further simplifications of the optimized microstructures? The answer is yes. As we can notice, they are actually these microstructure configurations can be represented by five different features. And we can use diff five different features to parameterize it. And this is the result we get. A small detail on that. Basically, we have uh, this uh, hollow super ellipse suit to parameterize it. So S2, S3, S4, together we form the main body of the microstructures. Oh, by the way, here I show only is one is of the microstructure. And together with the S1, they will come with these configurations. And S5 is used to punch uh, the holes here. Okay, now we have uh, parameterized the microstructures. Then we can perform a ship optimization to further simplify uh, the microstructure configurations. Same as before, first I tried to optimize a microstructures to maximize the Yash modulus. This is the result I get. And in the same case, I tried to uh, optimize a microstructures to maximize the buckling strength. This, this table shows the corresponding performance. We can see the buckling strength has been significantly enhanced compared with this one. If we choose different gamma one, we can tune the material Yash modulus and buckling strength. This table, this figure summarizes the result. In this, this part is topology optimized microstructure configurations. This is a shape optimized configurations. 
compared to reference designs, we can see optimized microstructures does show uh, significant enhancement in terms of, of buckling strains. However, those uh, enhancement at a, at the cost of the Yash modulus compared to topology optimized microstructures, uh, shape optimized mass structures has a slight worse performance due to the geometrical restrictions. With this, I would like to conclude my talk. Um, in this uh, presentation, we present a systematic uh, approach for design 3D single length scale isotropic material with the tunable stiffness and buckling strength. And both topology and ship uh, topology and ship optimization has been used to uh, design the single length scale class with tunable properties. And uh, of course, the optimization result reviews the material buckling strength um, can be significantly improved by hybrid between truss and uh, wearable thickness plate structures. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing this work with us, Feng Wen. Uh, with this, I will um, open for a question to all authors. And I cut you off before, Nils, so you um, get the pleasure of starting. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll start with you, Jorge, because that was my initial questions. And Feng Wen, I already know this work, so I'll let others dive into questioning that. No, so my question is, actually on the performance. So I, of course, it's nice to avoid starting with these Swiss cheese arrangements, but still, a whole seating really needed in 3D? You're saying a whole seating really needed in 3D? Yes, so I I'm sure, in, of course, in 2D, you could not make two walls meet and open a hole, but uh -huh. I would say in 3D, you could just start with a design which does not meet the boundaries unless you compute sensitivity information there, but that's kind of cumbersome for a little bit. So if you uh -huh. just push, like do a little- So you're saying you start with a design and you just change the initial shape of it. But yeah, there- Make sure that it doesn't touch boundaries such that you have non-zero sensitivity information. Then I would yep. assume that holes would appear yeah, in that case, though, remember that you cannot generate holes, you can only merge features, right? So no, in, how, no, how, how do you know you cannot merge, uh, create holes, sorry. How, how would you know that a hole in the middle of your domain, inside your domain, is not beneficial for your problem? True, but, but could, I mean, they can appear. And my experience is that they do appear, internal cavities. You know, but it... In the absence of any additional mechanisms, you level set cannot generate holes. Only what uh, Alicia Kim did from 2D to 3D, there you can use another level set field to inform it or with topological derivative. Like if, but you need to use something to, to inform the level set field to generate a hole, right? Because otherwise you have just shape sensitivities and you can only move your interface, right? Yes, so not, my, you my, cannot generate an interface. Is, let's think of this. Think of this as one member, or maybe two walls that are coming together, or a single blob of material, and uh -huh. then it will narrow in to an hourglass, and mm -hmm. at some point the hourglass walls will meet and a hole will appear. Yes, that can happen all over the place. Correct, correct, correct. But that that comes with other set of issues, right? Like it's. In that case, you can have lack of a structural integrity, right? For example, you have a mass minimization problem, right? Your problem is not really aware of what you want to do depending on what, how you formulate. I get what you're saying in the sense that in some cases, and this is true for some cases, right? You may not need to generate holes and you can get some, to some quote unquote good optimum, but how can you guarantee that you don't have better optimums out there? Because you're reducing your design space, right? You're restricting your problem considerably in some cases. Right, and and when you say and when you say that you have um, in this case, oh, you can have these two walls that are going to merge eventually. So remember that you cannot control that, right? So if the problems again, if you look at the level set, just yes, level set optimization, level set topology optimization approach, and you want to do something like just the force inverter, the typical benchmark force inverter problem, right? You don't have you just have the, the basic setup. 
your because of your shape sensitivities, what is going to happen is that whatever this hinge is trying to be generated, these two walls are going to come closer and closer together until they, they merge and then your structure disconnects, right? And that would happen regardless of where you have a whole city mechanism or not. So I would say my, my point here will be relying too much on yes. just- In 3D, I don't think we see that too much. It keeps- Too much, the that's the key word, too much. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but I mean, meaning that I have not done enough that I can say I never see it, but on the classical force inverters, we don't see it. It actually, because it doesn't, yeah, it can make a small hinge, which it cannot in 2D if you impose a length scale. No, so so my, my I would love to see your next study where yeah. you try to compare the performance of of your two approaches with a, the standard parametric or non-parametric, or whatever you call it, level set, where you just start with a block. Because I, I would assume, and this is to answer my own question, sorry for that, that your approach would be faster. But I, I would still like to see it in action. Oh, and then I have one more comment, and then I'll shut up. And that sure. is when you show this comparison to the density method, the, the, you showed it on, I think you called it Listen, Learned, and it's also in your paper. Yeah, yeah. oh, in the paper, yeah. 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 In the I would very much assume that you are comparing a design with gray with a, a, a solid void design. Otherwise, I have, I would, I have some doubts about the performance. Is that correctly yeah. understood? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, would, I would suggest to avoid that in the future. Yeah, it's more like of a guideline to 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 see the differences. Sure, sure. Like as I said, right. I cannot wait for your next paper where you compare these and show that your method is outperforming in terms of there, There's one, I have to call SMO, there's one that has been in review for a few months. If you know anyone, please help me. <laughs> ah, no, and for some reason, they didn't send it my way, that's for sure. So uh, I'm not the guilty <laughs> culprit here, but uh, thank but you. Now we know. Great work. And and now we know what you would have suggested. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have um, a couple of questions on the chat. I want to be mindful of everybody's time. No, I know that we are already um, past the half an hour mark. Um, a question to Emily from YouTube. Uh, this is an excellent project. Could you discuss a bit more on how you penalize the overlap of the different materials? Is penal the penalization increased over time through continuation? Sorry, yes, so let me, let me show the slide here. So yes, the, the answer to the question is yes, we do increase the penalization over time uh, or through a continuation process. So you can see that this is what the penalty looks like to penalize material mixing. You can see that the stiffness goes to zero when we have mixing at this back corner, both design variables are at one. And so stiffness goes to zero. And so the optimization doesn't wanna put both of the materials there because the stiffness goes to zero. But in this case, where we set gamma equal to zero, uh, you get increased stiffness by having mixing. And so that's not physical. We don't want that in our final design, but this problem is convex. So just like in single material where we do continuation on P to start with a convex problem and bias your solution, we do the same thing here. We start with a convex problem, bias the solution toward the convex one, and then gradually increase the penalty on both intermediate densities and mixing. I have a, a result here to show you how effective it is. Not necessarily the case for every example, but we have this here where you can see, uh, so this is the continuation scheme that we're using with different initial guesses. So the first one, so you have four candidate materials here. The first one, we have equal amount of each material at the initial guess. And the other ones, one of the materials significantly dominates at the initial guess. And you can see that with the continuation scheme, we basically get the same solution no matter what the initial guess is. This one is a little bit different, but the objective function doesn't change. Now, if you do it without continuation, here we set P equal to three, gamma equal to one for the whole uh, optimization process. Now you can see that whichever material dominates in the initial guess is gonna dominate in the final solution. Uh, when you have a uniform initial guess, it looks a lot like what we had on the previous slide, but the objective function is much higher. Um, so I hope that answers the question. Hope so too. Thank you very much. We have a, a question more for George. Oh, I'm saying your name completely wrong. I'm sorry about that. It is fine. Um, for Henry's, for Henry's very yeah. interesting presentation. And uh, now my chat disappeared. 
Um, I, I can ask it if you, <laughs> if you want, Josephine. Yes. Uh, yeah, please, so very please. nice, very nice work, Jorge Luis. Uh, yes, my question. Oh, yeah, you pulled up already the, the slide yeah. that I was thinking of. So how, how sensitive are the solutions to these relative values of these uh, W1 to W4 terms? Yeah, that, that, that's a good question. So a couple of things. So first, all of these components are normalized. So and, and the weights are chosen such that the contribution of what you really care about, the quantity of interest is much larger than this tree. So as long as this the first one is between 85 to 95 percent of 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 the entire objective. And as long as this one is larger than this or two, we're fine. So in terms of, you have some leeway there. So it doesn't have to be strictly, oh, this value has to be 0 0.9, 0 0.8, 0 0.95. Uh, uh, of course, your topologies change, but in terms of performance, it doesn't make a huge difference. But you have a good point okay. though, in the sense that, so I, the keyword here is contributions, right? One thing is how much, mm -hmm. what numbers you assign to this weight and a different one is what's the actual contribution to your objective, right? Because this affects your sensitivities and how your problem performs. So in this case, I mentioned that they were normalized and that's fine. But for example, you have to be careful here for let's say other non-standard problem formulations. If you don't see this as compliance, but something non-structural, I don't know, uh, like your chemical potential or something that grows exponentially, right? So then right. you have to use something like a logarithm to avoid like some orders of magnitude right. difference between this and this other one. Then you're no longer minimizing uh, your actual, what you care about, right? So yeah, yeah so you're right there. Does yeah. that answer your Thank question? Thank you. Yes, it does. Thank you. Sure. Um, we have one more question for Emily. Thank you for the presentation. While fitting lattices, uh, microstructures in your optimal macro topology, are there cases where you get that more than one lattice can fit the same voxel? And if so, how do you deal with that? What criteria do you use to find the best option, option among them? So the question, is, so are we talking about the optimization or, so the, go ahead. As I, as I read it's at the, G, at the level where you are applying the transition, um, okay. And if you have more than one option that could do the transition for you, how would you pick among them? So here we, we, we chose it based on preference, based on kind of an intuition to smoothly transition. So you can set whatever unit cells you want as your transition region. And then the macro scale slices that I showed that has this functionally graded color will tell you which one to pick based on the ones that you decided at the beginning. So there's no ambiguity because you prescribe it, I guess. Okay. All right. I hope that answers the question. Um, June and Feng Wen, did you square your questions <laughs> already? <laughs> All right. Um, I think, um, I think we are um, seven minutes over. So uh, this perhaps is a good time to, to wrap up. Um, I want to especially thank all the speakers um, who've joined us today and shared their impressive work with us. Uh, I want to thank the organizers for inviting me. And um, I, I don't know if June or Nils want any final. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you for joining us. Uh, just a short announcement. Our next meeting will be uh, it's scheduled for September 28th. Uh, it will be uh, organized by Professor Matthias Schwenners from KU Leuven. Uh, so looking forward to meet you next month. Okay. Uh, I wish everyone uh, have a good day or good evening or good afternoon. See you next time. <laughs> Thanks, bye. Yeah, thank you.